So I would like to uh, welcome everyone from Berlin on behalf of Robert Bosch Stiftung to this uh, session. Thank you for um, for your attention at this afternoon, at least in Berlin. I know that you are joining from, from all over. My name is Verena Heinzel. I am Program Director of Strategic Partnerships at Robert Bosch Academy at Robert Bosch Stiftung in Germany. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to our session on the report that was recently released, which is entitled Research and Advice in Foreign and Security Policy. And we are happy to present to you a few of our findings today. And before I say more words um, on the development of this report, I will give the floor to my dear colleague, Jenny Hecht from Mercator Stiftung. Thank you, Verena. Thank you everyone for joining. Also a few welcoming remarks from, from my side. I'm Jennifer Hecht. I'm a project manager at Stiftung Mercator, another bigger foundation in Germany, Germany next to Robert Bosch Foundation. And I'm really happy that we together commissioned this report and worked on it together, presented it already in Germany and several sessions together. And today we're here to give it also this more international look out. As a foundation, we are working in Europe and I'm from the Europe team and we are supporting think tanks and foreign security policy in Germany, but also are interested more more recently also actually more interested in the international order because we've gave ourselves a, a new strategy which will come into place next year and next to Europe's internal relations and the external perspective with two main countries, Turkey and China. We also want to look now into more into the multilateralism and how the international order is changed and think tanks are a vital part of that. So I'm super curious to see what we are going to discuss today. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so I also just want to highlight a few things. Why did we initiate this report in the first place? Um, both of our organizations are funders with a long history of corporations with and support for think tanks in Germany, but also beyond. And we had the impression um, that perhaps the German think tank um, scene is not ideally equipped to actually uh, give strategic advice advice on the level that is needed um, as uh, Germany now has a quite new role in the international order and everyone is looking to Germany and this new role. We understand ourselves as learning organizations and we want to learn what we can do better when we fund think tanks. And of course, we hope that think tanks also themselves want to understand their target groups and what they can, what they can do better to understand the objectives of their target groups to talk to them um, in a very efficient way. Um, the, ref the report provides recommendations of how to improve the interplay of the involved groups and um, uh, we will now give a short presentation on the main findings of the report and to draw lessons from the German case. We know, of course, that this is very specific, even though uh, the report also looks um, at the think tank scene um, in Brussels and also in London and Washington, D.C. Um, and then we will also engage with you um, in a discussion which is perhaps more of a comparative analysis and can see what are other regions facing in their think tank, think tank sectors. Is it the same or is it very different? And I'm very happy that first my, uh, my colleague Annalina Rehkemper, who works for FINEU, which is an organization, a German nonprofit analysis and consulting company, she will present uh, the main findings of the study to you. Um, and she con contributed major parts of the research to the study. Um, and then after um, Annalena's presentation, we will hear uh, a commentary by Enrique, who I think I don't need to introduce to anyone who is participating in the conference. And I'm very happy that both of you are joining us. And I'm looking forward also, of course, uh, to questions from the floor after um, these two inputs. Um, yeah, thanks again for this kind introduction, Verena, and I'm really happy to be here too. Uh, I look forward to discussing the results of our study with you and also to learn a little bit more about um, yeah, how this is relevant and also interesting for the international level. Um, I've structured this quick input into four main parts. Um, so I'm going to give you a brief overview of the study itself, so just to have a look at what we actually did. Um, then we'll have a look at the results uh, that describe the think tank landscape in Germany, um, then see how it compares to the international level, and then dive into the recommendations that we drew from this analysis. Just a quick note, I cannot see anyone, <laughs> I can't see the chat or anything, so in case you've got a question, just pop it in or write it down in the chat um, and then Verena can give it to me.
Yes, I will try to keep everyone uh, everyone's comments in view and others will help me out. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Good. Yeah, so let's have a look at the study itself. Um, so what did we do? Um, during the period from October 2019 to, 2000, uh, to May 2020, we analyzed 24 think tanks in Germany that are working in the field of foreign and security policy. Um, I guess there are many more, but this is just the think tanks in this particular field. Um, then we conducted 45 qualitative interviews, um, mostly with think tankers themselves, but also with their audience, so politicians, um, but also media representatives and some experts, and with the funders, so foundations, um, but also ministries who are funding think tank work. And in addition, we also held two roundtables with young think tankers just to get an insight into their perspectives on the developments of the German think tank landscape. Yeah, and now let's have a look at how we can describe this think tank landscape in Germany. Um, first of all, I would like to show you this graph because uh, it nicely shows how the number of think tanks developed over the past years. Here, um, the time frame from 2000 to 2020 is actually the most interesting one because here you can see that the number of think tanks working in the field of foreign and security policy has risen from 12 to 24, so it doubled uh, over the past 20 years. And as you can already see, um, we are distinguishing between different think tank types here, and I would like to introduce these to you now. Um, we began our analysis on the basis of this very common distinction between academic institutes and advocacy institutes. However, when we examined our interviews and the desktop research, we found um, that there are actually four main think tank types um, that define or that can be found in the German think tank landscape. These are the academic research institutes, the policy and the transnational policy institutes, as well as the activist and think tanks. And these think tank types, they can be distinguished on the basis of their impact strategies. So based on what they are actually aiming for. Um, so the academic research institutes, they really focus on scientific research and they make use of quantitative and qualitative methods. And their main goal is to publish in peer reviewed journals and to contribute to the academic debate. In slight contrast to that, there are the policy and the transnational policy institutes. These really focus on political consulting and their main goal is yeah, to draft policy recommendations and to publish policy papers. And in that sense, um, they aim at networking with political decision makers. Mm, the difference between the transnational and the policy institutes is that the policy institutes, they um, originated in Germany, while the transnational policy institutes um, are think tanks that originated elsewhere and now have um, another location also in Berlin mostly, but let's say overall of Germany. Um, and then we go clockwise down to the bottom left corner. There are the activist and do tanks. Um, these focus on campaigning. So they make use of traditional and social media platforms. Um, in order to gain public attention and support for their goals, um, and then in that way, uh, shaping the political and the public debate. Now, here it's important to highlight that these are, of course, ideal think tank types. Um, so if we regard one specific organization, we can say that they only make use of strategies from the policy institutes, um, because mostly they also base all their work on academic research. But this is just to see where the focus lies. Um, and I brought along this rough sketch. Um, it's just to show how these ideal types, they can be better used as poles within the think tank landscape. And here you can see like the activist pole, the institutional pole, where think tanks are more oriented towards the political institutions than the academic pole on the top and the policy oriented one at the bottom. Um, I just put a couple of the organizations that we analyzed into this field, um, otherwise it got a bit too messy. Um, but this is just to show you, yeah, how it can be used to locate the different think tanks. Um, and maybe let's pick out one example. Uh, that's the, yeah, let's take the ECFR, the European Council on Foreign Relations. Um, 
Of course, they base their work on academic analyses and make use of rigorous um, scientific research methods, but their focus is really on drafting policy recommendations and influencing the policy debate. So they are more closely to the policy oriented poll. Yeah, so this is how we uh, could describe the think tank landscape in Germany a bit better. And then we moved on to compare this to the international level. Um, yeah, I brought along this table which concisely summarizes um, our comparison. Um, you can see we compared lots of different points um, and I really want to focus on the proximity to politics now. So this is the first row. Um, and we compared the think tank landscape in Berlin to the think tank scene in Washington, London and Brussels. And a quick disclaimer here, um, with that we of course turned an eye towards the West and towards those think tank scenes that are more traditional. Um, so we didn't compare it to other parts in the world, but I would like to yeah, dive a bit deeper into that maybe in the discussion. Um, yeah, so coming back to the point of the proximity to politics. Um, so here our main example and touch point was Washington, um, because here we can observe a very close relationship between the think tanks and the political institutions. And this is really due to the effect of the revolving door. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. Um, it basically describes how think tankers uh, rotate into the administration and become part of the executive, stay there for four years, for example, then move out once the term ends out of the administration and back into the think tanks. Um, and potentially if the votes and the time allows it, um, they move back into the administration again. So this like this revolving door effect. I know that over the past four years, this has been quite different. Um, however, like on a broader scale, this is what we could observe for Washington. And then we compared this situation to the one in London. Here, we couldn't find like a real revolving door, more something like an escalator. Um, so people working in think tanks, they will at some point, um, not all of them, but some of them might uh, join the political institutions and take political office. Um, but there's no real revolving door because they would not like turn back then um, to the think tanks. However, and that's the second point here, um, think tanks in London, they also do a lot of consulting work um, on foreign and security policy issues. So they consult um, committees in the parliament or ministries. And then we turned an eye towards Brussels. And here again, we could find a very close relationship between think tanks and political institutions. However, this has nothing to do with the revolving door. So in Brussels, uh, we could not find a rotation from think tanks into political offices. But um, the think tanks in Brussels, they created a very central role for themselves. Um, they often offer lunch break events, panel debates, networking events, mostly on a weekly basis, um, which are close to the public. And they are only open to members um, or to those who were invited. Um, and so there can, so representatives from the European Parliament, um, as well as members of the European Commission, they can come together here in a very safe space and then discuss policy issues. So this is how there is a very close relationship between Brussels, uh, for Brussels. Yeah, and then we compared um, these three scenes to the one in Berlin. And here we could see um, a relatively removed relationship between the think tank scene and the political institutions. Um, that is not to say that there are no close connections and contacts between think tankers and individual politicians. However, on a systemic level, we could not find such a close relationship. Yeah, and all the other points of comparison are also quite interesting, but just given the time, I will skip them here um, and then maybe we can come back to these later. Um, based on the analysis of the think tank types and the comparison on the international level, we then um, analyzed yeah, the weaknesses and deficits that we could find for not only the think tanks, but also for the audience and for the funders. Um, and I don't want to spend too much time on this slide, but I just want to highlight one point um, per group. 
Um, yeah, so let's begin with the think tanks. Um, here, a central point of critique was the lack of practical relevance of the think tank products. Um, in our interviews, not only with uh, politicians and journalists, but also sometimes with think tankers themselves, um, our interview partners criticized that despite a very strong theoretical basis, think tanks, uh, think tank products um, often lack the understanding for political circumstances. Um, for example, how uh, politicians have to abide by the party line um, or how they are bound by the intricacies of international diplomacy. So this is one weakness in their products um, that could be mended. Um, then let's have a look at the audience. Again, here these are politicians and media representatives. Um, and here we could find that there is a lack of communication. So they do not communicate their needs or interests um, towards the think tanks nor towards the funders. Um, yeah, and then we can turn to the group of the funders. Uh, and here the main point of critique was something that we call projectitis in German. I'm not sure whether this is a term or a thing in other parts of the world, um, but it basically describes how funders give budget to think tanks, which is um, always specifically given for a certain project. And then think tanks have to um, make use of this budget for just this project and they cannot work on any other topics or ideas that they have. Um, so here a deficit that we could find is a lack of venture capital or free budget that think tanks can just make use of um, as they wish. Yeah, so that's um, what we analyzed, like the think tank types, um, the comparison on the international scale, and then um, the weaknesses and deficits. And based on this analysis, um, we drew recommendations for the three uh, actors, for the think tanks, for the audience, and the funders. Um, and this is what I would like to present now. Um, here on this slide, you can see that, of course, these three actors, they all have a stake in the think tank landscape. And if we want to increase the impact that uh, think tanks have on the political debate and on political decision making, um, then we need to change the overall political culture. Um, and of course, think tanks can't just do that by themselves. Um, so it requires a change in structures and processes uh, with the other actors as well. And so we came to recommend um, for the funders that they focus on their intended impact. So they should just ask themselves um, what they want to shape. Um, do they want to contribute to a more diversified public debate or do they want to contribute to a more scientific basis for um, policy decision making. Um, yeah, and based on these questions, they can then see whether it makes sense to support personal structures and development um, or to stimulate and also accompany um, the strategic research within think tanks um, or whether they want to provide certain incentives uh, to tackle unconventional topics. Then uh, we move forward to the think tanks and here we suggest that they focus on their impact strategies. So they should ask themselves, who are the ones that we want to address? Um, who do we want to reach with our work? Uh, do they want to contribute to the academic debate um, or do they want to contribute and influence um, policy making? And based on these decisions, they can then see like which of these are further recommendations um, make sense for them. So yeah, should they um, have a certain focus on their target group? Um, should they give priority to contemporary challenges um, or also strengthen their internationalization? And then thirdly, um, we recommend um, for the audience, for the politicians and media representatives to focus on their own needs and interests and then communicate these towards the think tanks, but also the funders. Yeah, and in this interaction or based on this interaction, um, these three actors can then all contribute to bringing about a cultural change within the political landscape and within the think tank landscape. Um, and in this way, contribute to think tanks having a greater impact on political decision making. 
yeah, and with that, I come to an end of this quick input. And yeah, in case you're interested, here again is the link to the full study. Um, and I think Enrique, you also posted it in the chat already. So I'll just end the presentation here and give back over to you, Verena. Thank you, Annalena. Um, it's not easy to uh, summarize uh, um, the study in such a short amount of time. And you will see there is a short version and a long version. And the long version has a lot more detail, of course. And now I'm really curious to hear from you, Enrique, what you think, uh, what is surprising for you, what is relevant in this international level, and what perhaps is too specific for the German um, landscape that you don't that that you cannot really take away um, from for you. So. What was surprising for you? Um, hi, thank you very much. Um, that was very, uh, very useful. Can you hear me? Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. Um, so I, I prepared some notes based on the, um, well, on the presentation. So I think it's, uh, it's good that I have them here. Um, I mean, first of all, I think this is this is very useful. Um, it certainly helps um, helps to um, understand the the landscape of this particular group of think tanks in uh, in Germany. I like the comparison. It, it provides evidence to what I think was my impression based on anecdotal uh, yeah. information rather than um, than this this type of um, top analysis. So let me uh, let me go over some of the key points of this uh, of this report as a way of, of providing that that comparison. Um, I would like to introduce some some key ideas. Right? So I think one of the things that um, I like Diane Stone talks about think tank traditions, regional or national traditions. Right. So as as you were saying, you know, we don't have to assume that every think tank in the world needs to be the same. Um, I like to think of waves as well and, uh, uh, you know, add waves to this analysis. So well, not all German think tanks are the same. German think tanks, you know, set up in 1960s are not going to be the same as a German think tank set up in the last five years. They're going to follow a different, a different narrative, a different way of working. They're going to be founded maybe by a different generation of people who think of think tanks in a different way, right? So they learn the think tanks maybe you know, watching uh, TV shows about politics in the US or in the UK. And so I think, oh, this is what a think tank is like. Or they maybe studied in a university elsewhere, worked in a think tank as an intern, and went back to Berlin and thought, I should set this up, right? So, so I think that that would be interesting to see in, in, your, in your diagram of your analysis of mm -hmm. think tank formation over time. It'd be interesting to see, uh, and you sort of show it, but... The, you know, the origins of different think tanks would be good. Mm -hmm. And then another point uh, to make is that Thomas Medbeth in his work and then uh, Joseph Brammel from DGAP have made very clearly in, in their work is that think tanks are of their context. And Adolfo Garcia in Uruguay talks about political knowledge regimes. So not just the knowledge regime, but the political knowledge regime. So how, you know, how knowledge is generated, communicated, and used is a political process, and think tanks are part of it, right? So, in other words, think tanks in Berlin do not need to look like think tanks in Washington, D.C., right? So, you know, we would have to change everything else as well for that to make, to make sense, which does not mean that there won't be some think tanks that are very similar to each other. Um, I agree with the sort of categories you, you provided, um, and, and I recognize this is about strategies, about how they, how they work. Um, but I think it's interesting if you think about the, if you want the business model of the organization a little bit more profoundly, then, then we might identify things like, for instance, affiliation too. Mm -hmm. um, so are these academic institutions uh, independent, academic think tanks independent of any other organization or are they connected to universities? And what you find around the, around the world is that often, uh, and in developing world as well, is that often these academic think tanks have a strong formal or informal affiliation to a university. They draw their researchers from the university who tend to wear two hats, sometimes mm -hmm. with problems. Um, and that's important for funders to know, just in case they might be supporting one organization but undermining the other. Um, but others, other times they are, um, they are off the university. So so they kind of work within an academic environment as well. 
Um, and then there are other other business models, like for instance, uh, consultancy organizations. There are a lot of new think tanks that are set up as a consultancy, as a private organization, private consultancy, small consultancy, often to avoid having to go through lengthy, you know, charity status, you know, uh, registration processes and things like that. Um, but they fulfill the same role. So I think this division is useful, but it might help to look at the business model as well. Um, um, I can, so let me go into uh, a comparison. I think um, I think what I what I understand from German think tanks is that I, I work with uh, GI uh, GA right uh, GI GA um, yeah, Giga yeah Giga yes they uh, I worked in a project with them looking at uh, think tanks in China some time ago mm -hmm. and and this was clearly a very academic organization academically driven in terms of what they were outputs they, the outputs were. Like. But I think that a lot of a lot of academic leaning think tanks in developing countries, they they are more aspirational in that they they were set up um, as a way of of doing work uh, in a context where universities were not functioning, and so they set up this vehicle separate of the university. Uh, they still had affiliation to the university, the individual researchers, but this vehicle allowed them to do work without having to go through the bureaucracy of universities that were in many ways, you know, ill-managed or collapsing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that sense. So they are academic because that's their origin, but they're not academic in the sense that they are not, you know, heavily engaged with policy and policy analysis and policy advice as your policy institutes. Um, and, then the, and then you have uh, organizations that um, have um, seek uh, academic, uh, you know, academics to staff the organization as a way of uh, addressing a credibility uh, challenge. And so in some parts of the world, there's an expectation that uh, a researcher is only someone with a PhD. So, you know, credibility of your research will come from your PhD diploma. And so there are think tanks, particularly in Africa, that uh, tend to seek uh, academics. Uh, to staff them, but they try to be policy relevant, and this is a big challenge for many organizations. Right? You staff yourself with 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 uh, with academics who tend to take a long time in developing their outputs, but you're trying to be relevant in the short term. That is going to create some some complete complications. Uh, I would say that transnational organizations, national think tanks, are clearly more common in the global north, uh, mm -hmm. not so much in the global south, with maybe some exceptions in. Uh, in South and East Asia, um, where there are regional interests, regional concerns, and um, regional challenges, um, there, you know, there are regional kind of uh, power imbalances that are going on, and so these um, these think tanks that to deal with you know not just foreign policy but kind of operate in some way transnationally are would be more common, but much much less so in in Africa and in in Latin America. Which means that think tanks tend to be very um, not parochial in the wrong sense, but they're very, very local, very focused on on what goes on locally. And and I would say that most think tanks focus on what goes on locally um, themselves. In terms of the way you structure think tanks, um, the analysis of you know their their proximity to politics, funding, outreach, digitalization, internationalization. Um, I, I mean, I agree with your analysis on on sort of global north think tanks. I would argue that um, that UK think tanks are a lot closer to politics than than was suggested, um, at least in, in comparison. Um, and I'll, I'll explain I'll explain why. But um, proximity to politics varies, and I would argue that think tanks in the global south, even though they portray themselves as um, as academic sometimes, as independent, as neutral, they are very close to politics and very close to policy making. Um, and I'm going to oversimplify this, but research communities in, in the global south, relatively speaking, are much smaller. Um, and policy research communities are equally small. So mm -hmm. the, the common origin of many of the policymakers, so there's a, there's a common origin to many of the policymakers and the researchers. So we talk about the bridge between think tanks and policymakers, so researchers and, 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 and policymakers. But in fact, this is, I think, is a symbolic bridge because the researchers in the organization, in the research center, and the policymakers in political parties or, or in civil service, they more, most likely come from the same universities. 
from the same classrooms and same same schools. And so there is a very strong connection between them. Informal, uh, often hidden, hidden it's there. Right? So proximity, I think we sometimes assess it as you know the you know people coming to your events, um, you know meetings in parliament or meetings in you know formal meetings. But there's a huge amount of proximity taking place in, informally. Again, funding, uh, it'll depend on the context. Um, maybe you've, you've, I think you've done a good summary of this in the, in the North, maybe in Japan, in Korea, you'd have more private sector funding, uh, where the private sector plays a much stronger role. Um, I think in developing countries, you'd find, you know, across the developing world, with some differences, you'd find a much, much stronger role of, in, of foreign aid, whether it's foundations, mm -hmm. uh, bilateral, multilateral organizations. You find a lot of government funding uh, increasingly through consultancy work, which creates you know, complications for the independence of think tanks and private funding as well for uh, um, consultancy work. But there are, of course, um, uh, exceptions to this. You know, countries like Argentina and Chile, Latin America, India, Indonesia, there are you know, large philanthropic um, you know, uh, actors for many, many reasons, right? Self interest, political. Um, uh, altruistic reasons that support um, think tanks. Uh, in terms of outreach, I would agree that most think tanks around the world, with the exception of the, you know, of the US and the UK, um, tend to be not very proactive or aggressive in their outreach communication. And I would say that in the UK, this, this mimics the, the, political, um, the political culture of confrontation. Uh, parties and the media are in the lookout for new ideas every single day because every single day there is a political debate, right? Mm -hmm. Every single week there is a prime minister's question time. In the US, this happens because there's so many entry points into politics. There are so many politicians. And since uh, political parties are weak, every member of Congress, every head of, you know, you know head of department, everyone at every level is a potential audience, right? So, so you're trying to get their attention all the time. Um, but most of the world, uh, it's been very much about a few people in government, a few people in power that you want to target. But I would argue this is changing rapidly. This is changing very fast. And so I, we see a lot more innovation in communicating with the more general public, either directly through better forms of communication, digitalization, etc., but also by partnering with NGOs, social movements, uh, and other other type of organizations. I think many think tanks are realizing that um, as the civic civic space closes, as experts are being challenged, um, if people do not know who they are, they are going to be uh, in danger in the future. Right? Not just in danger physically in some cases, like uh, personally in danger, but uh, in danger of their, their their relevance. Right? You know, they won't be relevant anymore. Um, and then finally, we talk about, um, I won't go through all the, uh, the comments here, or maybe one, one important comment, that is that because these communities are so small, there are quite a few gatekeepers to them. And I think that's important to, to recognize that um, these are uh, very small spaces. Um, and again, from my limited knowledge of German, um, of German think tanks with the Berlin scene, um, it might be it might be relevant. I mean, the UK is a small space as well. Um, the US is much larger, but Washington DC is a small space. Mm. Um, and so, in terms of recommendations, I think that it's very hard to come up with a ex ante design of what the think tank scene in a particular country should look like. And I think this has been attempted many many times in uh, in the global south. Um, not you know not with the intention of replicating you know. Canadian think tanks in Latin America, for instance, by IDRC or in Africa, not with that intention. I think it's just the, the idea is to um, kind of inject something, you know, some sort of new energy into the local scene. Um, but it's very hard to kind of predefine it. So I think, I think the, the best advice I would suggest, you know, I would, I would think about is it's about the promotion of local communities. So what you have in many parts of the developing world is islands of excellence. You have one or two think tanks that have been propped up by funders. Um, you know, maybe the, the World Bank started it, and then you know, then came DFID or XDFID and said, "Oh, because you're funding them, I'm going to fund them as well." 
And then maybe they came ID or C. Well, that's a reliable research organization. I'm going to give them as well some money. And then maybe came a, a foundation like the Hewlett Foundation, the Gates Foundation, and said, oh, because they are a strong organization, I'm going to give them a bit more money. So you've got one very strong organization um, that is producing research, but nobody else. So you don't have that career ladder you were talking about. There's nowhere to go for these, these researchers. Uh, where else can they go? There's no other think tank they could join. They, you know, they're so expensive themselves and the organizations that are almost unsustainable. So unless you have a community around or a system around, like Thomas Medvedev was, was, was referring to, you'll have a very weak and, and uh, unsustainable uh, research scene. So the question, I think, comparison between Berlin, the Berlin think tank scene and the, the British or the, um, so the London scene or the DC scene that I would ask is how self-sustainable is it, right? Um, do you have a constant um, sort, of, sort of production of new graduates, new researchers who could join the, um, the uh, think tank scene? I think there's, there's a lot of interest from young think tanks from around the world and certainly around Europe to join the, the German something that at least anecdotally we, we hear. You know, is there, um, is there a think tank community in, uh, in Germany? So are the think tanks engaging in some sort of healthy competition? Or are they quite comfortable in their own space with their own kind of boundaries around their issues? How much of a conversation there is, is, is there going on between them? Um, how much of a, of a policy research community is there? Um, so media, NGOs, activists, funders, politicians, civil servants, how much are they meeting, engaging, talking to each other? Because that's where you're gonna see some of that moving, that revolving door, secondment, uh, engagement. So. Uh, in the secondment, so the revolving door might not work for Germany because that's just not the German way. Or to paraphrase the um, the Chinese, it's not the it's not the uh, the, um, the the it's not the it's not the characteristic of the of German think tank to do to follow the revolving door approach. But there might be other ways of creating the same opportunities. Secondments might be one, for instance, having uh, members of uh, the, the, all these other groups, the media, NGOs, activists in your boards, um, associations, etc. And then finally, I think uh, it's, what is required is a local philanthropic community as well. I think that's something else that characterizes the British or the, or the, DC, the London or the DC scene, and that is not common in other parts of the world. And so I think one of the things that you see, you would, you would see in the UK scene is that uh, philanthropists of think tanks, funders of think tanks would know each other, right? And therefore they would, they would know, um, you know, who's funding what, why they're funding them, what they're getting out of them. Uh, they would also be active in engaging with policymakers, with activists, with NGOs. They're not passive, just funders, um, kind of a, this is a job that I do, I just fund you but they be part of the same policy community. And therefore this makes, makes it easier for them to kind of understand you know, the origins, the trajectories, the needs, the challenges, the opportunities that each think tank would face. I think this is very rare outside of, um, of a few countries in the global north and maybe a handful in the global south where most of the funding is coming from uh, institutional funders, right? So not political funders, but uh, kind of uh, altruistic foundations, you know, development foundations, or bilateral organizations, or multilaterals, uh, or government agencies that treat the funding as more of a transactional relationship than as a kind of uh, uh, a common uh, enterprise to bring about social change. Um, and I think, I think that would be something to also think about in terms of, of that community, um, of that extended community of think tanks in Germany. So I think I probably said more than I had planned, but, uh, but uh, it was an interesting uh, uh, presentation. It just gave me some more ideas to add to the conversation. Thank you so much. This was really enriching for us uh, to hear from you, uh, your perspective on you know, other regions of the world and how you see the landscape there in comparison to what we are saying or what the report is saying about the German landscape. It's really, really fascinating to see the diversity and to see that they're very different needs and also different deficits. Um, so perhaps, uh, you know, it, it would be interesting to see where the German sector can really learn from, you know, how perhaps also younger sectors, younger landscapes and other regions are just building away from, 
from uh, um, from there. There are many questions that I also have, but first I want to bring in two questions uh, from the audience. Um, one question was um, posed to Annalena, um, how effective was the feedback um, to the report? How well was it received? And first, I perhaps want to say that we've had several meetings and presenting this report and um, there's generally yeah. great interest. Uh, of course, it's a little bit harder with the policy makers and we're still figuring this out in times of Corona, how we can um, you know, um, bring the report and result directly to political decision makers in Germany. Annalena, what do you want to add to this? Mm. Um, yeah, I think at most of our events, it was like, uh, so So the recommendations were taken up really well. At the same time, they had a lot of feedback points to it and also pointed out what we need to change in the end is the whole culture of the scenery. And I think that was very important to understand that our recommendations, they don't hold true for each and every organization. But then again, we need to see like, what's the character of the certain organization which recommendations can they make use of? And then overall, if we want to really change the landscape, then we require like a systemic change. And here it's not like one organization or one types of actors um, that can bring about yeah. this change. Um, so I think it was well received, but also in a really highly debated atmosphere, which I really liked because uh, I think we as authors also learned a lot from this. Yeah. Uh, and it's Alina, actually great you... to see, but just, uh, sorry, just, no, just, just add to this, uh, it's also great for us to start a dialogue, a stronger dialogue amongst German think tanks. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, of course, they already know each other and it is a small scene in the end, um, Enrique, as you said, but I think it's also great to see that I think they are starting a dialogue now and we hope to continue mm -hmm. this in a good way. Yeah. I was going to follow up on a question, but I, I wonder if there, if you notice a difference between the responses from, for instance, academic, the academic think tanks and the activist think tanks or the policy institutes to some of your recommendations, because the recommendations are, um, you know, about being more policy oriented, you know, uh, you know, doing more communication. You know, I can uh, I can imagine the the responses would be different. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm not sure whether I can respond to this directly. It's just like an anecdote, maybe. Because um, yeah. so what I've taken from the more academic think tanks um, is that they're really interested in understanding how they can improve their communication skills. And then they want us to tell them, OK, what should we do? Right. Like, should we engage in um, gaining more presentation skills or do we need um, skills with like um, video conference calls or just like video platforms, is that what we should develop? And is that also what we should invest in? Um, and here, I think from our point of view, it's really something that we cannot recommend to anyone just on a general basis. Um, but then again, think, tam think tanks just should decide for themselves whether this is interesting or not. No. But perhaps just to take this away, uh, one big thing was really what is the ideal think tank staff, yeah. uh, and and I think um, that's a big sort of. Um, yeah, learning. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think most of the think tank representatives really said they are working on this, but it's also very complicated to find the right uh, sort of profile and then also to hire the right one. Mm -hmm. As yes. uh, you know, some of the think tank salaries that uh, German institutions can pay is not what perhaps um, is attractive for the experts that we need. Yeah, there was another true. question um, that I also want to bring in um, the implications for the think tank communications in Germany. And um, perhaps we already answered this. I don't know if uh, this is already has been helpful. Mm -hmm. John Schwarz, do you want to come in yourself and ask your se second question? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi John. <laughs> that worked. I'm amazed. Wow. How exciting. Great. I thought that was a little bit easier. <laughs> Hello. I'm, I'm interested in this because I, I'm, I'm from Soapbox. We're a communications agency for, for, for think tanks. And we now have a member of staff very exciting and I was going to, I was planning on spending some of uh, quite a lot of this year visiting Berlin and visiting some of these think tanks and seeing uh, unfortunately I obviously I, I went once in February and then of course that was it um, but maybe next year uh, and I'm really interested in your, your report focuses on uh, foreign and security policy but I've really noticed a real a real strength in climate um, policy in, in many of the think tanks I've been talking to in Germany as well. Do you think that the same kind of findings might apply for, for other issues? 
That's a very interesting question, I would say. Um, we focused on this topic, perhaps just to outline this, um, because we felt, as I said in the beginning, that, uh, you know, Germany's role in the, in the international order is really sh changing and that perhaps the think tanks focusing on this topic are not really responding to this sort of responsibility in a way. So this is why we focused on this topic. Annalina, you, can mm -hmm. you say anything about um, the other think tanks, um, climate in particular? Yeah, so of course we did not like a, a conduct a whole analysis on, on these other topics and um, policy fields, but I believe that what we found for the foreign and security policy sector, this also holds true to a certain extent for other topic areas. Um, and then I think it would be really interesting to just like include further think tanks who are working on other topics um, either into this analysis or conducting an analysis um, for these fields themselves. Um, yeah, so I'd be super interested in doing that. Um, but then again, yeah, in this um, analysis, we could not respect um, like the, the climate itself or also other issues as, for example, the corona pandemic, where I think lots of questions like um, just public health, global health um, could have been regarded as well. And, and I guess the pandemic is, um, has, um, in, in, in our assessment, it has sped up a lot of, uh, a lot of these processes. So, mm -hmm. for example, digitalization, for sure. Um, many, many organizations have resisted um, through their young, younger generation's demands for um, greater use of digital tools and services until now. And they've just have had to embrace them um, really quickly. I think we've seen some of the think tanks that were better prepared before the pandemic taking advantage of the fact that mm. now all the events are online everybody is kind of accessing information digitally um and i think others are noticing this um and responding responding to it so uh, we have seen some more kind of emulation of um sort of best practices among think tanks that were kind of initially slow to take uh, to take on some of these innovations in the way they do work in the way they communicate um, their work. Yeah, and maybe just an insight on the um, communication part again, because um, also when we held the roundtable with the young think tankers, um, we found that they were very interested also um, in understanding um, for how they can communicate their results, the results of their analyses and researches um, towards not only the general public, but also politicians themselves directly. Because apparently, as we also found in our interviews, um, the way in which this is um, processed and presented at the moment, like papers, policy papers, this does not always appeal to the person reading it. And we also mm. found that they say, well, if there's a paper that's longer than five pages, I'm not sure whether I'm going to read it. Um, and so the question really is, um, how can you just like process and then present this knowledge, these facts in such a way that it is, um, yeah, communicable and then also usable for the people, like for the addressees? Yeah. Yeah, don't start me on that. That's why we've got... <laughs> <laughs> well, I was planning on visit. That's why you're there. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to leave now. But I've been, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. Thank you very much. Yes, it's a I very important follow, point. Sorry, I wanted to follow up a question that you mentioned, Verena, on uh, on staff. Um, and so um, I think that's, uh, I agree, that's a key, it's a key challenge. Um, and um, you know, it's difficult to find the right, the right think tank staff. The think mm -hmm. tank uh, profile is not, uh, is not necessarily the just a researcher, just a communicator. Uh, Simon Maxwell has all um, of it, um, right? <laughs> yeah, you have to. But uh, yeah, I think more than more than individuals, you need a team. You need to build these teams that have these different skills. You know, the good networker, the good communicator, good researcher, good doer. You know, good um, good manager sometimes. But um, I, I have another question about the you know whether you looked at this in the think tanks. But um, the career progression. I think you referred to Annalina. So it's this. Um, um, and I think in many parts of the world where the community is not very dynamic and very, very active, um, think tank, working a think tank is, is for life. Whereas in other places where, where there is a lot more crossover between sectors, think tanks can be stepping stones. There can be moments to come back after a period in the private sector or in the public sector or in the media to reflect, to think, come up with new ideas, and then you go back. Um, there are, you know, you, you might be a, director of a think tank at say 35 
but you don't expect to stay there until you're 65. You know, you'll do your five, 10 year term and then you move on to something. There'll be something else for you that feels like a career progression. And I feel that in many parts of the developing world or in many places where the community is too small, there aren't these opportunities. And so you end up having very kind of, sort of very older generations are sticking around for too long mm -hmm. or sticking around in the same role for too long rather than taking on new roles within the organization, right? Um, and I wonder what it, you know, if you can reflect on the, on the German scene that set that way. Um, you know, I, I would expect there would be many opportunities to go different places, but maybe the culture is not about moving around. It's about staying put, so. Mm. Annalena, can yeah. you and reply to this? Yeah, um, I think that's a very interesting question because we also um, looked into how career development um, and just like personal development can happen within the think tank scene in Germany. Um, and we found that there is a lack of training for young people who want to join in a think tank and then yeah progress in a certain career path. Um, so this is not really given, but then you have to, often, very often, you have to enter with a PhD already in your back and then like um, start working um, and start progressing in your research career within this think tank. Um, however, what you're pointing out here is something that we did not analyze. So how then later on you can progress in your career within these think tanks. And I think that's yeah. a very interesting point. Um, what we discussed a lot, however, was that many people who are working in think tanks, um, they often then lack the experience from political institutions or other institutions that would be um, a fruitful influence in their work um, and, and a good addition to their work. And so we discussed ideas um, for rotating um, into political institutions, learning something there, and then maybe moving back. Or again, and here we're with a recruitment question, um, like how think tanks can also recruit people from political backgrounds or who have experience in political institutions yeah. and then bring these experiences into the work of the think tank. These are some issues that we discuss and uh, try to analyze as well. Um, however, with the whole career development, I would like to take that uh, with me and also look into this a bit further. Yeah. And perhaps just as a general description of the German um, career scene, my my um, impressions or observations are that the sectors in Germany are quite strictly divided. It's very right. it's not easy to to yeah. switch from academics to politics or from politics yeah. to think tank. So um, I think this is a weakness in the German system that there are sort of highly professional paths for each profile, but it's not yeah. so easy to jump back and forth. So perhaps flexibilities that mm -hmm. might be more in the US system, I would not see so much in the German system, but we would need it for a better um, interplay between these yeah, um, yeah these these branches. So, so yeah. would you would you not have the situation where kind of a um, you know senior civil servant retires or you know and then decides mm -hmm. to go go into a think tank to write a book, for instance, and they get a or they get a fellowship or they get a um, you know they get hosted by an organization for a few months or a year or something. Um, mm -hmm. Um, so I think we could observe this for a couple of institutions that are very right. traditional and rather the big institutions where the funding yeah. is there because very often of course if like senior experts come in they also have certain claims with regard yeah. uh, <laughs> to, to the budget that's uh, behind it and yeah so I believe we can say yes to this question um, with regard to um, yeah the more traditional organizations but then the young think tanks um, I don't they know, they are around, like 10 15 years now they can't afford it and then and uh, yeah. it's just a lack of funding for this, really. Yeah, okay. Anyway, interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't see any other questions from the audience, even though, of course, I cannot hear the audience <laughs> in, in this digital format. Yeah, that's a bit weird, right? <laughs> Waiting for yeah. questions and then not... <laughs> Well, we're just we're just on time, I think. So it's uh, yes, that's it's, perfect. It's good, um... Um, but I want to thank uh, Annalena for her presentation, of course, and for all her remarks to the questions. And Enrique, thank you very much for doing this sort of spontaneous commentary on the spot, which is not easy. It's no, very enriching for us to I learn about to learn about <laughs> the other regions. Really, um, I think we learned a lot, and we'll take this uh, with us. Um, and when we think about putting this report more in an international. Um, 
spotlight. So thank you very much. Thank you to the audience also, of course, for your intention. You're welcome.